So now I'm going to um, give a quick intro to content writing. So um, uh, it's easier to kind of think about the content writing problem in for us in terms of IPFS, given um, that we uh, a lot of us are really familiar with it. Um, think of um, the traditional HTTP model as being um, as not having to solve the content writing problem because the um, how to find the content is embedded in the URL, URL to some extent. So a URL like example.com slash foo bar bass and so on um, has a, a name system. Um, so the domain gets mapped to an IP address. There's routing for the particular computer. So there's not exactly content routing. There is regular IP network location routing. But once you connect to those machines, those machines are supposed to know what that content is. And they can tell you whether, you know, they can either return that content to you or give you an error. Now, in reality, there's content routing systems underneath those, those machines. So when you think of large cloud systems, um, within those, um, whenever you get to those uh, machines and you request a resource or something like that, there usually is some form of content routing. But that usually happens entirely within one um, administration domain or one single uh, service, which means that there's a range of sophisticated tools that they use within one uh, mode, of, uh, mode of control to then um, provide whatever resource you're looking for. So if you think of like an S3 bucket or an image on a social network site or something like that, there's some sophisticated system underneath um, where, where the machines that are handling your request to find the specific object you're looking for and return it to you. But the problem is a lot easier when you control the thing end to end, right? So when you completely control that system, um, you can evolve that system over time, you can uh, uh, scale it to meet requirements and so on, and you don't have to deal with um, having to write a protocol that a lot of different participants uh, uh, handle. So the content routing system, so the content routing problem uh, emerges when you uh, decouple the um, location addressing in the web and you do um, content addressing. So by moving to content addressing and gaining all the benefits that that confers, like the um, being able to uh, route things by cryptographic hash and so on. Um, now, the way that we solve this is that we first have to do a step of um, mapping the name system to a content identifier. But then we have to go from content identifier to finding the specific set of participants in the network that have that content. And that's where the content routing problem emerges. So um, the the content routing question is, how do you go from that um, CID to the set of participants in the network that have the content and do so in a decentralized um, protocol? So um, think of it kind of like, think of the, the IP routing world um, and, and the whole large set of systems that are designed to route IP addresses. Um, and think of an equivalent um, system emerging for routing um, content addresses and routing uh, different, different um, mapping the locations of all of the different uh, resources and being able to, to uh, route your particular request to, that, to wherever the nearest participants are. Uh, sometimes it's also not just about near participants. Sometimes you, you have to deal with um, authorization requirements or authentication requirements and so on. Uh, so it's not just as simple as finding all of the participants. You also have to take into account um, who the request is coming from are they authorized to view this resource? Are they authorized to find out who has uh, relevant content and so on? So there's a bunch of um, um, uh, details there and so on. Um, the good news on all of this is that it's not harder than IP routing. So IP routing is a pretty hard problem. There's an enormous set of um, protocols and massive scale systems that enable IP routing. Um, content routing is a similar uh, scale of problem. Uh, so it's totally doable. It's just a matter of um, getting there. Uh, to sort of talk a little bit about scale, uh, currently in the in the Falcon network, we um, this is the broad map of of the system. Um, think of the just to mention scale for a moment. We're talking about already hundreds of petabytes of data, so that's a lot of content to to uh, route. Um, if you think of um, yeah, let's do a quick calc. So 100 petabytes. Um, let's say it was a current chunker at 256k ish. But like average, um, yes, yeah, so this is on the order of three, four hundred billion records ish. Does that sound about right? Times something like 
100 bytes per record or more, 200 bytes per record. Yeah, so, so you're, we're dealing with um, a, a 40 terabyte rec, uh, set of records just for the content on PodCoin today, right? So 40 terabytes of content routing information, um, and that's sort of like the order of, of magnitude that we're, that, we're, that we're dealing with. So um, uh, one other component here is um, when you think about CDNs and you think about the layout of the internet, you would ideally like to solve the content writing problem as close to the requester as possible. So if somebody's in, um, th think of the big internet as a massive grapevine where there's all kinds of um, different domains that, uh, all di different sub-networks of devices and your request from a particular computer at the, at the edge is being routed to a whole set of machines, you ideally want to solve the content writing problem as close to the user as possible to minimize the latency of, of, of returning that request. So if you can get to tens of milliseconds, like that would be great, right? If you send a request out from a house somewhere and there can be a content routing system um, right in your ISP, you can resolve a lot of the requests right there um, and redirect the user to wherever the content is without having to go all the way to um, sort of the rest of the network. I know that this is very different from how traditional peer-to-peer -peer systems have solved this problem. The traditional model here is, oh, route everything through a DHC, and this is what IPFS has been doing uh, for a while. But when we do that, you end up with very long latencies to be able to uh, retrieve a particular request because you um, are having to hop around the entire internet trying to find uh, who has a particular content. And so you end up with, um, uh, without like a very high throughput way of, of being able to resolve these queries. Uh, just for a sense of scale, like this is um, the, this sort of like the range of objects that are getting generated by various different applications. And you know, this is three years ago, you can imagine this continuing to grow, a bunch of these continuing to grow on some exponential graph. Um, and so this is the number of like uniquely routable objects that all of these applications are generating. So in order to have a very efficient and very uh, successful content routing model for the, for the internet, we have to solve a problem of this magnitude, meaning you need to be able to do um, page load quality latency. So a user opening a web page, entering a, uh, an address and pressing enter or entering some search terms and pressing enter and be able to um, render requests to the user in like human perceptible uh, time scale. So that means you at most have on the order of like 500 milliseconds before it starts feeling slow. Um, so you have to like, so, so content routing systems have to, for the most part, for hot content, um, solve that problem. Uh, get to the point where a user can, um, you know, if you're going to, if you click a link for to a specific tweet, you need to be able to render that tweet on the user's computer and the content on that tweet, so the, the actual information in that tweet and the images or whatever it is associated and which other tweets and so on in less than 500 milliseconds. Ideally less than 300 milliseconds because 500 already starts getting slow. Um, now of course you can amortize a lot of this um, knowing that the user was already on Twitter or knowing that the user has already be, been seeing tweets from the same um, sub-networks or whatever. All of that can kind of narrow down the problem space uh, but ideally, you want to get to like that level of random access to this number of objects. So this is a, a very non-trivial problem, right? Like being able to solve something at this scale um, requires um, treating latency very seriously when when you design a system. So you don't want to be hopping around the internet because if you hop around the internet, you're now dealing with 100 to 300 millisecond links every time you you know send a message out to somewhere else, right? So if a if right now here from Iceland we send a message to San Francisco, that's a 150 millisecond or 200 millisecond hop. Um, by the time we hear back, I guess 200 milliseconds there I'm back, right, roughly. Um, by the time we hear back, we maybe get like one more of those before we're already done. Uh, so we, we can't really do systems that require many hops to many nodes to be able to, to, um, to route. Um, so this is kind of like another sense of uh, scale here, this kind of typical um, 
cloud style workloads. Um, I've kind of estimated in the past that we, the if you think of all of these applications and you project their growth to, um, to some extent, being able to handle 10 to the 15 objects or 10 to the 18 objects is roughly where you want to be. Um, there are probably not that many objects uh, or won't be that many objects uh, soon, but being able to build systems that can handle that scale um, is, is roughly where you want to be. And uh, yeah, again, the you, you need systems that can handle large scales and do so with very low latency. Uh, so that to, to me, that very much constrains the problem, and we'll talk about this more later in the um, uh, constraints section, uh, but that, that very much constrains the problem to having to replicate a lot of the indexing information and put it close to wherever it's going to be requested. Um, so let's maybe talk about the problem a little bit formally. So the think of the a, a content routing system as enabling users to find content in a network. So the the find part is like this query that, that um, content router, uh, users are going to do. Um, and so that's the search process through a system. It's a routing query. Um, and content, here we, we're going to use CIDs to, um, uh, to map all of that. Um, in lipid p terms, that means finding other peers. Uh, so that means specific um, public key addresses um, that you can then map and find um, the actual IP addresses or everything else to be able to connect to them. Um, ideally, you have glue records that there or things like that that can give you the information so you don't have to do additional hops to, to find those peers. Um, people might be familiar with this interface, which is kind of like uh, we, we have this notion of provider records where there are content providers that are providing um, some content to the network. Um, they map it in terms of it, it's a tuple of the, the CID that they're providing and their particular peer ID. Um, and then the clients have the ability to search, like the, the find part is find providers for a particular CID, um, and that should return back a, um, an asynchronous channel of multiple peer IDs over time. Because you want the search process to start returning things as quickly as possible, uh, while the system continues to look for more potential uh, providers. Uh, because you might find a set of providers, but they might not give you the content. Uh, you might not be able to get the content from them, you might try reaching them. They might not be online. They might not. You might not have the right authorization. They might not want to interact with you or whatever. So you need a system that can. Um, th there's a, a um, one one to many mapping between like every CID. There's many provider, possible providers. Um, by the way, note that it this doesn't have to be uh, completely consistent. So you do not need a full view into all uh, providers in the world. Um, and you don't even need a um, you don't need a lot of providers. You just need enough providers to make the the routing query successful. Uh, so this kind of um, we, we talked in the past also about kind of record systems. So you can sort of create a record which includes the CID, the peer ID of the provider, um, and you can use the private key to create that record. That's a non repeatable non repeatable record, which means that once you create that record. Um, there's that particular peer uh, stated that you know if, if there's a signed record with with a CID, that particular peer is using their identity to declare to the network that they do indeed have this content, um, which is tricky for any content that might be um, censorship uh, might be a target of censorship at some point because that means that you can get find these signed statements across the network that particular parties had particular content at particular moments in time. We'll talk about all of this. Um, all these kind of properties tomorrow, but um, you know, these kinds of things can sneak in in there. Um, so now there's probably a, there's a whole set of properties that you might want to have in systems like this. So things like, uh, sorry, I need to get rid of this uh, animation thing. Ah, reader. Um, so think of there being um, things like, uh, just from a, a traditional distributed systems, uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Um, you, you want to be able to um, find uh, find the, con the content in the network. You want to be able to have high availability. You want the system to work through network partitions. Um, so a, a user trying to request something should be able to do so with high throughput, even if like the rest of the internet is getting disconnected from them or whatever. Um, you want very high um, uh, performance in terms of the uh, 
throughput of raw records that you would want to be able to to uh, to handle, um, and you you have search. Um, there's some efficiency requirements on the on the search process to make sure that, that ideally that's that should be O of one on the um, on the size of the network. Meaning, um, it sh you sh the 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 search query itself should not grow um, with a number of nodes in the network. Uh, if it does, then you're in, in a really bad um, you're, you're in a bad spot because uh, that that might mean that additional hops are going to be introduced in the search, and that each of those hops, if they're not locally in one region of the world are going to add, you know, 50 to 100 milliseconds um, per hop. And so like that, that'll, that can bust your entire um, solution. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole bunch of, uh, we'll talk more about security properties. I, um, uh, there's a long document that uh, I've been working on that has tons of different properties related to the security of, the, of these systems. Um, we'll talk more, uh, more about this tomorrow. Uh, so just to kind of put things into perspective, this is roughly sort of like my grading of what content routing through a DHT um, roughly looks like, where you have, um, it, it, there's pretty good uh, scalability in some senses. Um, so roughly a DHT is like okay for the distributed systems model, but like not great. Uh, this is why it was a good starting content routing system. You can use DHTs when you have a small amount of content, um, but they quickly get bad in terms of uh, performance of the search, right? So this like triple fire thing is like flagging that in a DHT, in traditional log n DHT um, in Kademlia, to find content, you're gonna have to take log n hops through the network to find it. And if that, that routing query does not take into account where you are in the world and what um, the latency of your, your two other peers and so on, then um, you're going to end up waiting multiple seconds to um, request something. And so in the tweet example, imagine that every time you click the tweet, you had to wait like three to four seconds for it to load. And potentially sometimes more if like it can't find it, right? It's like that experience does not work. Um, the good news is the HTs are really space efficient, meaning um, as you add more nodes into the network, you add a lot more capacity and you can deal with huge numbers of, of uh, of records, so so that's like um, uh, pretty good. Uh, DHTs also score fairly well on some security properties, things like resilience and permissionlessness. So anybody can join a DHT. Um, they're pre pretty robust to certain kinds of failure. Uh, they have some problems with um, things like Eclipse attacks and so on, where you can do some amount of censorship resistance. Uh, sorry, censorship of records. Um, but for the most part, DHTs tend to be used because they have reasonably good. Um, uh, security properties. Another problem, though, is that in DHTs, you do not have reader-writer privacy. Um, there's been many approaches to try and imbue DHTs with reader-writer privacy, uh, but in general, it's extremely difficult to do it, um, in great part because whenever you're looking things up, you have this trade-off between wanting to terminate the lookup as fast as possible for the user, but if you do, um, then the network learns something about the information that you're requesting, who's requesting it, from where, and so on. So you end up in a really bad spot if you try to provide uh, reader-writer privacy with a DHT-like system. Um, the approaches to try and hide that include issuing tons of other queries to try and, uh, and hide your legitimate, legitimate accesses in the noise, and so on. Um, but in any, in any case, like um, we need to be evaluating many different content writing systems over time with this kind of lens of being able to see various different properties. Now today, we don't have to worry about the bottom half, like the security and, and, um, and, and privacy and so on. Like all of that stuff um, is not for the short to medium term, that's more for the long term. Uh, but we ideally want really high performance um, systems when it comes to the, um, yeah, the, the uh, speeds of, uh, of being able to query things and um, just being able to handle uh, a certain set of scale of, um, of records. Uh, cool. So I think I'm going to uh, stop here and, uh, yeah, move on to the, to the next talk. Any, any quick questions that I can um, maybe answer about this? Or, yeah, I guess two questions if there's any. Yep. Um, do you think it's good by, like, calling uh, multiple fragments? <laughs> Um, 
Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, we're talking super generally here. So you could have many different kinds of, um, th there are many different ways of like thinking about these kinds of these networks. Um, a lot of like DHT like systems have this model where all of the participants in the network act as routers as well. So you have both the, the, the content providers and the content consumers both acting as routers in the network. Um, and you try to organize that into a, into a system. Uh, there are other uh, structures that distinctly separate the, the parties that are doing the content routing into a different type of agent that is neither doing the content providing or the content consuming. Uh, and then you get a lot more flexibility in designing things. So you can do like, um, meaning that for a particular content route, you, you can design a content routing system to do what you described. And that can totally work. That could totally work. Um, but now, whether that particular strategy works in a particular system is a yeah dependent on that on that on that system. Yep. Are there examples of like routing systems that do uh, it in all one like in constant time? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, um, what would happen if you um, you know had a very straightforward um, th think of it kind of like a hash table if you if you can enumerate the set of participants sorry the set of like possible routers in a network um, and you know their identities um, you could assign them a particular part of a key space and you know always that like just go to that par participant for um, for it so if you have churn in the in the participant set then you have to like deal with that but if you can enumerate the set of participants and store that then you totally can do it, right? And and that can scale pretty well. You can get to, you know, how how big does the list have to get before it gets unreasonable? So it's not an asymptotical complex, it's complex to the language. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and 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 yeah. Probably it, it's impossible to achieve it, not in general. Uh, say, that, say that one more time. Uh, I mean, like, probably it's impossible to achieve it, not in general. Like, to have constant uh, asymptotically, probably it's possible. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on, again, it depends on the design of the system, because if it's not open membership, then you can get uh, asymptotic performance uh, to all of one. If, if, you, if you have consistency on the, on the set of content routers, um, then whenever you're doing a query, you know precisely the set of content routers and you can go precisely to the to those, and you get O of one um, on every on every request. Um, but in, enforcing consistency on the set is like diffi difficult, right? However, what do blockchains do? Blockchains enforce consistency on modern proof of stake blockchains enforce consistency on all the um, on all the consensus uh, nodes, right? If you're going to be a consensus participant, you have a permissionless ish way of joining a network and getting promoted to participate in the consensus. Um, and once you do, everybody in the network knows that you're participating in the consensus and you know precisely all of the nodes and so on. And you can get that to scale to hundreds of thousands to millions of nodes. But you may not need millions of um, content routers. Like, Earth's not that big. So you, you might be able to deal with, because the number of content routers depends greatly on the latency, right? So. You, you want to be able to, to serve one of these requests with ideally something like 50 milliseconds. And so that means that you just need enough content routers to be able to deal with uh, you know, a lot of queries in a particular region. You, know, you need enough of them laid out everywhere on the, on the internet to be able to serve you know, 50 millisecond level queries. And then you need full replicas of everything you need right there. Uh, or you know, full-ish. It doesn't have to be with full with high consistency. It could be... Um, you just have like the hot part of the content, right? The, usually content has this drop off rate where a tiny fraction of the content is requested the most. Um, uh, cool. All right.